Hello and welcome to Telecom TV from Mobile World Congress 2017 in Barcelona. And we're here in the discussion zone at the HPE booth in Hall 3. And it's time for our Telecom TV panel discussion, which today is on the journey from 5G ready to 5G deployment. And joining me to discuss this journey, I have on my immediate right, Paul Crane, and Paul is Head of Mobile and Wireless at BT. Welcome, Paul. Next to Paul is Javier Lorca, who is RAN Innovation Global CTO Office at Telefonica. And next to Javier, Edwin Grace, Chief Technology Officer at the Etsy Standards Group. Gentlemen, thank you all for joining us, as I say. Um, now, we know marketing teams love new generations of mobile. It gives them something new to, to, to sell and exciting for customers. But often in the race to be first to market, there can be complications. You know, is, it, is it a good time to go now into 5G with 5G ready or whatever you want to call it, equipment? Or is it best to wait for standardization to run its course? And in 5G's case, through to 2020 for the in initial um, full standards. Um, what's the best evolution path for operators and really when is the right time to actually market 5G to customers? Adrian, could I ask you first of all about standards because the telecoms industry is renowned for its standards work, um, very involved, very specific, but it's worked and it's worked for a lot of years. How important are standards still as we make that move towards 5G? Well, I think you've, you've already made the point that this industry is standards based. And I don't really hear anybody arguing about that or putting a contrary view, because over many decades we've learned the value of having a standards-based approach. It's enabled us to have multi-vendor interoperable solutions. Perhaps more importantly, as we go forward with mobile communications, we're looking at reducing cost. End users want to pay less and less for their terminals, and they want those terminals to do even more and more things. So if you want to get the price down, you have to bring the scale up. And that's one of the, the major benefits of having a standards-based uh, solution. Moreover, one, the, the whole process of writing a standard it is about building consensus. So it, it, it's the end point, if you like, of a lot of hard discussion. But once you've made that decision, it's the entire industry that then moves forward with that, with that standard. So the, the, the uh, monopolization, if you like, of the standard is not left to chance. It's an inherent part of the consensus building process that, that brings us that standard. You know, Paul, as, as one of our two operators on, on the panel, what's your view of, of standards? The whole industry, and particularly the mobile industry, the, the whole success is actually based being based on those standards. You know, they're getting the ecosystem and the cost down so devices can work in the network, but also so operators can work with other operators as well. And that, that, that's a, been the, you know, the key driver of the industry and will be the key driver, still be a key driver in 5G. Standards are, are, are just crucially important. Javier, yeah, similar view? Yeah, I have exactly the similar view. Uh, for us, it's crucial, and this is definitely uh, uh, of maximum importance for us to keep the standards uh, evolving in the best way, not only for technical reasons, but also in order to explore the best way to reach users and to give the customers the best services. And also, indeed, uh, in 5G, compared to previous generations, we are witnessing, for the first time, a change in the paradigm uh, by which uh, networks will likely deploy uh, be deployed and, and, and evolve uh, with a different model compared to the past. Instead of, for example, having like a, a collection of network features and uh, functionalities that you may, for example, acquire or not, or activate or deactivate, uh, we want to, to have something based on NFB and SDA from day one so that we can, for example, flexibly deploy things upon demand and uh, relying on uh, standard technology as possible, I mean, IT hardware, uh, uh, virtualized platforms, uh, not proprietary interfaces anymore, and building consensus among all the stakeholders, but not only for technical reasons, it's also for economic reasons. Mm -hmm. yeah. exactly. So it's uh, absolutely crucial for us. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there are, there, are, there, there are two points. The one is, the standards process is seen as being slow, okay, and we, I don't know, at we, we need to focus on actually how we actually speed the standardization process. Is crucial, and secondly, we shouldn't we shouldn't let standards creep into areas where it's not essential. Okay, we should actually only focus on those areas where where it's really essential for us to enable that e e that interworking and to develop that ecosystem where you end up with cheap devices and you can work between operators. So, Adrian, are we looking at a, um, a, a framework, the standards to provide that framework, and then allow vendors and 
telcos to, to, to innovate around that um, in a more open environment. Yeah, I mean, standards have two dimensions. They have both breadth and depth. So you, the, the important role they play is to standardize enough to enable the interoperability in the multi-vendor environment, but not standardize so much that you stifle the innovation. So as Paul says, it's getting that right balance between you know, how far should you go with standardization. You have to standardize the essential elements, but you don't need to go beyond those essential elements. I mean, uh, Javier, you've already touched on NFV and, and, and SDN there. We'll, hopefully we'll come back to that. But w when we look at, we're seeing, especially at this show, there's a lot of um, products that are 5G ready, 5G enabled, pre-5G. Yeah. Um, a lot of these are around the, the air interface mobile aspect. Um, are those products really 5G ready, 5G enabled? Is it worth, as an operator, seriously looking to implement those products now, knowing that we've still got a long way, so it might be slow, but we've still got a long way on the standards process to run? I, I mean, there isn't, there isn't a one-size-fits-all answer here. I, I think the, the, there is a case for, for doing investment, particularly in the core network, you know, as we were saying, about you know, that transformation to virtualization, and that transformation to um, you know, NFE, SDN-controlled, um, in a 4G network, and, and by doing that, you've built a effectively a 5G-ready core already, with, with, already. On the RAN side, it's slightly different because you don't you, you don't want to do um, you know regret, regretful um, investment. You, you 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 need to be really focused in that space, and so you, I think you need to be much more cautious. Okay that release 15, 3GPP release 13, and, and compliance with that is where you really need to function on the RAN. Uh, um, uh, yeah. Have they? Yeah, I think uh, for the first time, I think we are lucky that uh, some of the most advanced and interesting technical innovations uh, in 5G are indeed happening now and can be tested in 4G, even in limited forms, like, uh, you know, millimeter ways for fixed wireless access, massive MIMO, virtualization, cloud run. These are things that will happen uh, will have like 100% uh, uh, advantages in 5G because the framework will be prepared for that from day one. But we are lucky enough that we can test some of these innovations in 4G. So in my view, 4G LTE Advanced and LTE Advanced Pro is the best platform to test pre-5G, uh, so to say, technologies and innovations towards the customer to test the capabilities of the techniques and the technologies that we are testing uh, to know how uh, our networks uh, must evolve towards 5G in order to cope with the challenges ahead. Uh, we talked about virtualization, but it's also other things like the economic feasibility of deployments. Uh, for the first time, we will be able to deploy 5G in conjunction with 4G. It's a different story compared to previous generations, where you will be able to, for example, uh, have the coverage and control with 4G, and uh, uh, yeah, the widespread deployments with multi and with data, and then with 5G in hotspot areas, you will be able to provide opportunistic access to high data rates. So I think it's very interesting now to use 4G as a, as a benchmarking for future technologies. It's interesting because when we look at the, the possibilities of 5G, um, there the, are the two approaches to the radio side, the new radio side, there's a standalone with a new core as well, and there's a non-standalone which sort of links into L LTE. Uh, you know, operators here, um, do, do you see as, as that's, that's the first step, is, is to keep leveraging LTE to introduce 5G? So, so I think, I, I, you know, so what's a 5G network going to look like in the, in the 2020 time frame? And it's very much likely to be a, you know, an LTA pro network um, with islands or, or, or a grid of, five, or, of, of 5G integrated together into a HetNet. So, so it's so it's really important to carry on evolving your LTE network, and then and then introduce uh, 5G in that context. I don't think you're going to see a you know a big bang approach where it suddenly goes from from 4G to, to to 5G. I think Paul makes a very important point that is often misunderstood because you often hear or you you perceive 5G as being the new radio, when in fact 3GPP is very clear on the fact that 5G as a system includes both the new radio and the evolution of LTE Advanced Pro. It includes a new core network and the evolution of our existing core. And it's that complete package which we offer as a 5G system. So it's not just about new radio. It's yeah. uh, uh, the LTE Advanced Pro will play a big part in delivering 5G um, uh, performance. Really. And coming back to um, how, we, how we describe all this uh, um, equipment and services, 
is there a need for perhaps a a, a, a universally recognised term for anything that's not quite 5G to enable telcos to, to give telcos some kind of security over future interoperability? Yeah, so so I, I think we have that. I mean, I think we have 3GPP and we have really release 15. And, and you know, I'm sure our marketing departments will like you know will play with the Gs, okay? And yeah, you know yeah. when they, but but from an engineering point of view, I, I think we have that already, and we, st we we absolutely need to carry on with standardization and the interworking testing, and, and appropriate due diligence at that level to ensure that the services actually actually work. And you know, and, and, and uh, my role is you know leading the research work is to take some of the, those early concepts that we've got taking them into the labs and trial them to see you know, how they behave from a performance point of view, but also how they, how, what needs to happen for them to interwork. Please, have you? Yeah. No, I, I wanted to say only that uh, you are also lucky in that, for example, non-standalone networks uh, will be relatively soon, will be ready for uh, testing and, and, and being deployed relatively soon for enhanced mobile broadband applications. But I know, for example, that uh, in many countries they're expecting, for example, in Latin America, they're expecting some form of fixed wireless access uh, for like uh, rural areas, open areas, where non-standalone versions is actually not needed. It's more like standalone uh, new radio or whatever, but integrated with the fixed core to provide the broadband services to households where fiber, for example, is too expensive. So we have like the two options already from uh, in this year and next year. Fixed wireless access will be ready. Enhanced mobile broadband will for sure be launched uh, very soon. And it's only the tricky point that the spectrum is not harmonized in millimeter waves yet because there's some issues with uh, coexistence with satellites, with backholes and so on. So this will have to be fixed. But I think uh, it's very good to have the two options right now non standalone and standalone, yeah. And Adrian, uh, Paul's already mentioned uh, release 15 there. Um, can, can you give us a brief idea of um, what the release schedule is? Because it's not just 15, is it, with, with 5G? Can you give us a brief idea of, of, of where 5G fits into the cellular evolution? I mean, the, the 3GPP current plan is to have two phases. The first phase, which will enable sufficient functionality for those who want to deploy early looking around the 2018 time frame, that's release 15. And then for those who want to deploy in the 2020 time frame, there will be a second phase. But I should point out that uh, on Monday this week, um, a number of operators um, have put forward a proposal that we should do what Paul says and try and actually be faster to market with our standards. So you know, there, is a, there is now a discussion that will take place next week within 3GPP to see whether we cannot even bring that forward by a, um, uh, several months. So it's, it's a case of the standards body is trying to respond to the operator's needs. Uh, just following that point up, um, I know that there's 22 companies in, in, involved in this. Um, I don't think Telefonica is, but BT certainly is. Well, just, can I particularly, why? Why, why, the, why the need to, to bring forward? Why is it so important? It's important to us that we continue to meet our, our users' expectations of, 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 of the network. And we see that, that that step to some of the 5G technology as being crucial, not just, not just for the, the consumer um, and the retail end, but also for, to support the other use cases that we talk about in 5G. And then we're seeing a real need emerging for, for example, low latency services and connected cars. For example, um, we're, we're seeing um, um, uh, also a real need for expansion of IoT, with, you know, with particularly sensor networks, with smart cities, and, and other applications. And we want to, we want to ensure that those are driven forward. It's a real difficult balancing act in 3GPP to you know drive the standards quickly, but ensure that the you know, vital components that are needed by operators on don't accidentally get dropped out. I think I accelerated the standards is great in general because we want to provide customers with 5G services as soon as possible. Uh, the, the concern that we have and the reason why it didn't support, we, we didn't support this, uh, this acceleration even, for, even faster that, that, than today is that uh, there are some technical points that require deeper discussions at some uh, levels and uh, we think that uh, the current progress in 3GBP is too much in a hurry in order to take appropriate decisions for the future uh, in important points like network slicing, architecture, uh, going beyond enhanced mobile broadband, but preparing the network from day one for more advanced uh, services, more advanced use cases, ultra reliable, the decision of waveforms. Uh, there are many points which require, I think, deeper discussions and uh, uh, 
accelerating even faster the standards, uh, we think it's not the best idea. We, yeah, we, 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 we saw this same situation in 3G somehow. The, the 3G hype uh, created like a, a collection of technologies uh, very quickly organized in release 3, uh, release 99. And that created some problems afterwards because technology was not mature at some points. There were some channels that were introduced uh, without the necessary level of testing and agreement. And I think in 5G, it may happen the same. We have seen this in the, for example, channel coding uh, discussions, uh, the waveforms, and several things which we think it's very important uh, for the industry to, to, to get some consensus and to bring more results and more deeper discussions. So uh, accelerating is great for the customers, but we think uh, 3GPP should take its work at the proper pace. So yeah, it's well, a bit tricky. Well, it sounds <laughs> like it's going to be an interesting discussion uh, next week then. Yes. Yes. I, I, I was going to say, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Adrian, you, you mentioned there's a meeting coming up very, very soon with 3GPP. Can you just clarify, is, is that the next couple of weeks? And, no, it uh, is next week. This is next uh, week. Starting on Monday to Friday, it's the plenary meetings where the project's um, highest technical groups get together to, to set the master plan for the next three months. Uh, and that's where this proposal will be discussed. Yeah. And I guess there'll be some long evening sessions before finally yeah. at the end of the week, we decide whether to stick with the existing timeline or whether we take the proposal to try and accelerate. And of course, there's always a trade-off between time, quality, and cost. So you, you, yeah, you know, yeah. it's, it's a matter of whether that acceleration has, has merit that's, that's worthwhile or not. And, and it will be for industry next week to, to decide on the merits of, of both yeah. options. And it's industry-led, so at the end of the week, industry will have decided um, what the timeline is for 5G, whether it should be accelerated or not. Yeah, so, so it's interesting because I think you've heard both sides of the mm. argument. I mean, both operators have got exactly the same ambitions, mm. okay? That's exactly, and, and what we want to achieve out of it, but it'd be interesting to see how those get resolved. So, uh, so good luck. <laughs> so. Well, you know, we, we, we could continue discussion for, for quite some time, but in a way, I just want to get to next week now and uh, see what the outcome of that, that, that yes. meeting is. So perhaps we'll have, we'll have another yeah. discussion uh, once that, that's finished. Yeah. Uh, but, but for now, gentlemen, Paul, Javier and Adrian, thank you all very much indeed. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you.